Can you hear me all right? Is the microphone on? Yeah. Just because you hear me does not mean you'll understand what I'm saying. <laughs> I'm trying to modify, uh, I'm going to try to modify my heavy Indian accent. I have a little bit of hillbilly uh, by learning and staying here for 40 years. Uh, I stayed in New York for three, four years, so you see a little bit of Yankee. Um, and uh, I was in Denver for a year or two, so if you see a little bit of Western. So it's, it's, a, it's a very hodgepodge of a beautiful accent. And, <laughs> and I have a device here. If you fall asleep, it's okay. But if you start snoring, suddenly the alarm will go off. So you are welcome to take a nap, uh, but don't snore very loudly because then you will have to buy a sleep apnea machine and a CPAP. And we lung doctors make a lot of money on that. <laughs> but Dr. Wyckoff, thank you for a generous introduction. Whatever success we, we have had in East Tennessee is not just one person's success. It's, it's, a, it's a combination of efforts of uh, Dr. Kursky, Lisa is there, many public health uh, nurses, uh, physicians uh, in the community. But what I'd like to do today is present an interesting case. And what I'd like to do is go over some of the epidemiological changes that have occurred in tuberculosis in the last 40 or 50 years and see what we can learn from it. If you were to learn from tuberculosis over the last thousands of years of history of tuberculosis, it will take a whole day. So I just took a small segment of uh, a tuberculosis, a, a, a huge history uh, and a phenomenal human experience of pain and suffering and how we came out of it. Uh, but I cannot summarize all of that uh, in a short time. But let me start with an interesting uh, case. Uh, this is a true case. I did not make it up. 27-year-old uh, uh, African-American female. Uh, uh, came to uh, our clinic. Uh, she was an ETH student. She had a positive skin test. She's referred to us because uh, she has positive skin test. But when she came to our clinic, uh, we noticed that she was from East Africa. Uh, she was actually from Kenya. Uh, she, was first she had first denied any symptoms, but had low-grade fever and cough. She was treated in the student health clinic, and nothing against the student health clinic. Okay, I'm, they are good people. Uh, she was treated with acute bronchitis and antibiotic. She had lost 10 pounds, and this was attributed to depression. Now, this is not her picture, but picture like this is all over the internet. A pitiful, thin patient being treated for active pulmonary tuberculosis in a sub-Saharan Africa, uh, in developing country where tuberculosis affects mainly the young, uh, active population, and affect both society, and it has a great impact on the economy. Uh, of Anybody wants to make a, make a diagnosis of this uh, chest extra finding? Without taking your time, I'll show you that there's a right lower lobe uh, infiltrate. There is some uh, cavity-like uh, uh, finding over, right over here in this area. Uh, and right cardiac border is fairly intact, so it's probably not a right middle lobe uh, pneumonia, but the upper part of the right uh, cardiac border is somewhat involved. So I would not be surprised uh, if there is some uh, right middle lobe involvement. But look uh, what happened. Uh, ordinarily, we, we give INS preventive therapy. But INS preventive therapy is not to be given if tuberculosis is in differential diagnosis. Because single drug, as you know, will cause drug resistance. And we are glad that we did a chest x-ray that has shown this right lower lobe cavitary lesion in a patient who was just sent for a positive skin test. But you have to understand the culture and the epidemiology of TB in Kenya. People, unlike in our country, younger people get tuberculosis in Kenya. And the incidence of tuberculosis in East Africa is six or seven times higher than uh, USA. And that is why, in spite of two antibiotics, seeing three physicians, tuberculosis was missed. When she came to our clinic, not only we did a chest x-ray, uh, we induced sputum, and these red snipers, the acid fast organisms, are mycobacterium tuberculosis. The, the tragedy here is she was attending the classes. 
she was coughing on some of the classmates. Uh, we had to do a big contact investigation. Uh, she insisted she want to go back to her class. We asked her to wear a mask and she was not, you know, she, a young lady didn't want to wear the mask because she was afraid of. But the, the, the main issue is I'm presenting this case. ETSU student, she five foot two, hardly 92 pounds. Uh, she has gone to 82 pounds and she blamed that to the depression because she left her homeland and she didn't like the food here. The truth was she was having evening fevers, chills, cough, small quantity of blood, but she would not tell you all this unless you know the culture. I happened to be in Kenya a long time ago and I, I knew the people, so I had to sit down, give her a cup of coffee and say, tell me more about it. It's not just depression. She was going through active tuberculosis. And then I went through my own charts and reported this. We have been seeing 40 to 50 international students every year in our TB clinic from East Tennessee State University. And they are referred to us for positive tuberculosis skin test. They have no symptoms. So INS preventive therapy would be the right thing to do to prevent tuberculosis. Only 10 to 15% accept INS. And these are some of them are public health students, some of the students in medical school, some of them are doing masters in engineering and computer science. And you wonder why they would not accept something a ATS, Center for Disease Control, standard guideline. Do you know why they would not take uh, preventive therapy when they had a positive skin test? Anybody? I mean, I, Dr. Kursky probably knows this. They all have been reading the old literature that if you have BCG vaccine, you will have positive skin test. Now, what they did not read is the fine print. It clearly says that BCG induced positive skin test generally wanes off in seven to eight years. There was a beautiful study, two twins, I mean, twin, two, two, two brother, brothers, one stayed in India, one came to USA, they both had BCG vaccine. The one who came to USA after seven to eight years had negative PPD. One who stayed in India continued to have positive PPD even after seven to eight years. Because the kid in the, who stayed in a high endemic area continued to have a new exposure of mycobacteria. And that resulted in persistent positive tuberculin skin test. If you do not know this, uh, you would say, well, all positive skin tests, even after seven to 10 years, is from BC. BC. Not true. A lot of our ETSU students do not understand that if you had BCG at age three and you still have positive PPD skin test, it is not from BCG. You have been exposed sometime later in your life uh, to have positive skin test. The sad story is only half of them complete the isoniazid preventive therapy. And most of them reject the preventive therapy because they blame BCG vaccine for positive skin test. Now this is just East Tennessee story. Nationwide, we are getting 450,000 foreign students in our universities. 450,000 students. And if this is true all over the nation, only 10% are getting the benefit of preventive therapy from uh, isoniazid and a positive skin test. As you all know, this group knows very well, tuberculosis is transmitted by an airborne uh, small particles going in the air. One person gives TB to another person, and of course that is the way of, of transmission. But remember, this is not the way it was in early 20s and 30s. I have a little nice poster that used to hang on every uh, uh, railway uh, station. Don't spit, uh, the, the flies will take your bacteria and somebody else will get through your food. That is not the way TB was spreading. But for a long time, the so-called public health worker, the, the birds and the bats, the, 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 the watching watchdogs, had a wrong idea that tuberculosis was being spread by fomites or by flies. In reality, it is an airborne transmission. To wake you up, this is a scary uh, slide. It is not a very scary, but a very interesting slide. Uh, this is an identification of mycobacterium 
uh, DNA 5,400 years ago in the Egyptian mummy. This was reported in 1998, but I want to share this with you. That as back as 5,000 years ago, Egyptian, in fact, uh, King Tutankhamun had tuberculosis of the spine. And this big hump you see in the back uh, is a sign of so-called Parts disease or TB of the spine. There are interesting mythological stories about tuberculosis in Chinese literature, in Indian literature, in Hindu literature. Uh, the, the king Daksha married his daughter to the Lord of Moon. And in those days, they thought the moon was always perfect, bright moon for all the time. But the Lord of the Land of Moon mistreated this, this new bride. So the king Daksha got married and said, you will die all of tuberculosis. So 15 days, the, the moon gets uh, bigger. And then he gets tuberculosis, he gets thinner, 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 thinner. In fact, the word consumption uh, in Sanskrit means kshaya, means you are slowly becoming thinner, thinner, thinner. The best way to lose weight is to get tuberculosis. No, I'm not saying you should get But the point is, the moon developed tuberculosis. Uh, finally, Lord Shiva intervened and said, okay, you will not die. For 15 days, you'll get thinner, and then you will slowly get better and better and better. I don't know whether the moon went to sanatorium, or he got the anti-TB therapy. But the point is, even ancient literature have beautiful story about tuberculosis because thousands of people, thousands of people have died of tuberculosis. More people in last century died of tuberculosis than World War II and World War I combined. WHO last year reported the incidence of new cases of approximately eight to nine million and the prevalence about 14 million cases of tuberculosis in the world. And approximately one and a half million deaths due to tuberculosis. This is a disease that has a 97% cure rate. If you have developed flu, can any doctor give you guarantee that you're going to be all right? If you develop diabetes, can any endocrinologist give you guarantee that your diabetes is going to be all right? No. If you develop tuberculosis, and if you have a drug-sensitive tuberculosis, and if you take the drugs that I prescribe, I give you 97% written guarantee that in six months you are going to be all right. Only disease where 97 to 98% cure rate. I do not know any other disease that has such an effective treatment since 1945. First description by uh, Sir Potts in 1779, children with kyphotic kypho spine called gibbous deformity, and the risk factor for tuberculosis spine are diabetes, HIV infection, and previous TB exposure. Now this slide is to wake you up. Uh, the politics you think only started uh, during the election time. The politics was present in 1882. This is a picture of uh, Robert Cox, who made the remarkable discovery of uh, mycobacteria. Before that, people thought that it was a guard get mad at you, or you had a bad air you inhaled, or your nutrition is bad. But Robert Cox, when he first identified mycobacterium tuberculosis as the organism, he is presenting this particular lecture, his discovery, at the monthly meeting of the Physiology Society of Berlin and not the Pathology Society of Berlin, because Warschau, who was a pathology uh, president of the uh, society, did not get along with Robert Koch. So <laughs> Robert Koch made a remarkable discovery that changed the history of tuberculosis forever, could not present his paper in the uh, uh, National uh, Academy of Pathology in Berlin, uh, because one pathologist didn't like him. So he had to go to physiology society, and he made his hypothesis. And it sounds very simple, but his hypothesis is, I'm sure some of you know the Cox hypothesis. In order for us to blame a particular bacteria as the cause of the disease, you should be able to find the bacteria in the body or the secretion uh, from that particular patient. And if you take that organisms to an appropriate 
host or an animal model, you should be able to produce the disease. And as long as Robert Koch lived, he thought that he was 100% right. During the last four years of his life, something very sad happened. A general practitioner in Berlin himself developed bronchitis. And every winter, he would get his sputum examined, and it would be acid fast bacilli positive. And he sent a, his own uh, report to Robert Cox and said, I don't have TB. I, I mean, every, how can I have every, every winter TB and I'm still alive? Uh, and, and Robert Cox was very sad that his hypothesis is not true. Actually, his hypothesis was true. It was 30 years later that we found out that there are some atypical mycobacteria other than M tuberculosis that can cause bronchitis and lung disease. So Robert Koch's theory is still true. This is to wake you up. Uh, TB is a disease of romantic people. If you are in love, if you write poetry, if you, if you have music, be careful. <laughs> you are likely to develop tuberculosis. Uh, uh, this is uh, Chopin. Uh, at times he used to get depressed. He one time tried to kill himself. Uh, he developed tuberculosis. Uh, this is to give you a sort of a broad historical. In 1860, uh, tuberculosis was declining. Uh, but at that time, uh, somewhere around 120 years ago, tubercle bacilli were, uh, were found. And then about 10, 15 years ago, tuberculin skin test came around. Actually, tuberculin skin test was not invented for human beings. It was invented for cows. Cows were dying of tuberculosis. Uh, and farmers wanted a test to see which cow to slaughter first. So the cows that had positive PPD skin test were slaughtered first so the other cows would not get tuberculosis. Now, a phenomenal thing happened after we pasteurized the milk. Incidence of tuberculosis drastically declined particularly abdominal tuberculosis, once you started boiling milk. A simple but a phenomenal change in the epidemiology of tuberculosis. And then, of course, we got chemotherapy. We all blame or credit anti-tuberculosis therapy for the drastic decline of tuberculosis. Since 1945, streptomycin when miracle drug came, the tuberculosis started to decline at approximately 5.5% every year. But remember, tuberculosis was declining long before anti-tuberculosis therapy came in the market. It was a change in the demographics of the people. The crowding in the family was going. People were moving from small village to the city. The nutritional level was changing. People were smaller families than the crowded family. The prosperity was changing. So socioeconomical changes had affected the incidence and prevalence of tuberculosis and resulted in decline long before the effective anti-tuberculosis therapy gave us the bright result that we have today. And this is, uh, I'm going to talk about extrapolmic tuberculosis in a while, but incidence of TB started to decline before the anti-TB drugs came in the market. TB is a social disease with medical manifestations. And I'll show that in a, in a few seconds, but you all know this. In my clinic or our clinic, large majority of the patients were either poor, did not have insurance, and Dr. Kursky can vouch for that, and most of them were alcoholics. These other patients, no other doctors want to take care of them because they didn't have insurance. Had we not had a public health clinic, these patients would not get adequate care for tuberculosis. Now here comes the, the, the modern era. Tuberculosis was declining approximately uh, at about 5 to 6 percent every year until you come to the HIV era when tuberculosis continue, sorry, tuberculosis stopped declining at the same rate. The rate of decline uh, was beautiful until it leveled off. And Center for Disease Control did not know why the rate of decline went down. So they just said rate of decline has gone down. But actually, if you draw this graph in this line, then this is the excess cases. So actually, tuberculosis was going up when the rate of decline had stopped. 
I remember Dick C. Snyder, the director of tuberculosis in that made a public announcement that HIV epidemic that is coming has very little to do with tuberculosis because we are seeing tuberculosis not only in people age 25 to 45 who have HIV, but we are also seeing increase in tuberculosis in the children. Well, I had to call Dixie Snyder and said, whenever there is a tuberculosis increase in the community, children are the first one to get it. So if you have incidence of tuberculosis in any county, any state, any country, think that the new cases of tuberculosis are being in infused in your community. It took five years to realize the full impact of HIV epidemic in our nation. In the later year, after 1987 onwards to the 1990, you actually see the increase in the incidence of tuberculosis in the USA. Between 1982 and 2006, not only the straight line stopped, the line started going up. So if you really look at the reported cases of United States between 1982 and 2009, there were uh, there was a resurgence between 1985 and 1992. The good news is, after 1992, we are back to the decline of tuberculosis. Now, this is the incidence or morbidity in the United States, 2001, 5.6 per 100,000, and now we have 4.6. But I remember when I first came to East Tennessee in 1977, the incidence of tuberculosis in East Tennessee was 27 per 100,000. We were 10th or 11th highest in the nation for incidence of tuberculosis. Today, incidence of tuberculosis in East Tennessee is 3.9 per 100,000. We are below the national average. We are below the state average for incidence of tuberculosis. And the reason is, one of the things that we did not do early on is directly observe therapy. If I had, I had two patients, one was my dog and one was my patient, and if that patient happens to be a physician, guess who is more likely to take medicine regularly? I think my dog. There has been a published paper from Philadelphia, 128 physicians with tuberculosis, and they were all given anti-TB therapy. After three months, the compliance of physician patients was less than 50%. We human beings don't like to take pills after first. I mean, if you had URI or UTI, and if doctor gives you antibiotic for 10 days, I bet you, with all this PhD and MD and nursing degree you all have or we all have, first three days, we are very, very regular. The fever goes down, symptoms get better, and we stop taking medicine. Ah, it'll be all right. Oh, I, for oh, I forgot. Oh, I'll take it tomorrow. Maybe I'll take two tomorrow. Lack of compliance has been the leading cause of resurgence of tuberculosis. And this is what it looked like in 2006. Tennessee is still higher than the national average, but you can see the most of tuberculosis in the USA is in Florida, New York, California. The recent immigrants are the one where the tuberculosis, and this is where the most important epidemiological lesson we have to learn in the current century. It is the new immigrants who are probably more susceptible to reactivate, or they are bringing some active cases. There's a beautiful study from, from, from UK. New immigrants, particularly coming from Africa and India, they tend not to have a car, they're sitting in the home or a factory, they don't get enough sunlight, and guess what? Vitamin D level in new immigrants is quite low, and low vitamin D level is associated with reactivation tuberculosis. Most clinicians do not know this. And most of the reactivation of tuberculosis among the recent immigrants happen in the first five years. If we just give them a little more sunlight, a little more vitamin D, maybe we will not have tuberculosis. Simple solution. But we always like to have a complicated answer uh, to a simple situation. This graph is to show what I just said. Trends in TB cases in foreign-born persons, United States, 1986 to 2006. You see that yellow line slowly going up? In, the, in 1986, uh, only 20% of all TB uh, was uh, from the foreign born, and now it is almost 60%. Almost all the cases, uh, or almost 60% of all cases, 
of active new tuberculosis are from the foreign born. So this first case that I presented to you, who came from Kenya, she was skinny, she's young, she's depressed, she's not eating well. Physician in the student health clinic should have suspected tuberculosis. I'm sorry, I'm not, I'm not pointing finger at anybody, but evening fever, coughing up blood. Instead, she got two or three courses of antibiotic. Oh, it's bronchitis, it'll go away. It's bronchitis, it'll go away. This is because lack of knowledge of epidemiology of tuberculosis amongst our physicians, particularly in the area of low endemic uh, cities and countries. Another interesting thing is estimated HIV co-infection in persons reported with TB in the United States. All this time, we have been blaming HIV epidemic, which is true. HIV ep epidemic did increase the incidence of tuberculosis between the 1986 to, to that, that 1994. But HIV epidemic did something good for us. Now, I hate to say this, and don't quote me on this, but thank God, as a TB doctor, I'm happy that there was HIV epidemic. I would not repeat this outside this room. But what happened during HIV epidemic is all the TB funding came back. In 1982, the amount of tuberculosis program funding throughout the country had gone down by about 60%. When I was doing my fellowship in Denver in tuberculosis in 1977, my program chief said, Jay, why are you spending whole year on tuberculosis? Because by the time you go to practice, TB will be gone. CDC had made an announcement that by the year 2000, there will be no TB in the United States. These are our prophets. These are our philosophers or forecast tellers. And here stupid me learning tuberculosis in 1977. TB is still here. And the reason is, the moment the incidence of TB was declining, the Congress, the administrators, the wise people cut down the TB funding. So not only HIV was the problem, public health infrastructure was going down when tuberculosis was declining. And we were caught red-handed when TB started going up. That's when the new funding came. That's when the DNA probe came. That's when the new drugs came. That's when the, the new TB clinic funding came. That's when DOT or deductible therapy started. Had that not happened, we would still be struggling. And that's the important lesson. Do we have to have crisis to do the right thing? You decide. Now, this is a primary isolated resistance in US born versus foreign born. I'm not Rubio, but I like to drink water. So. <laughs> but look what happened here. Foreign born persistently tend to have higher isoniazid resistance, and that is a real, real issue. Uh, and not only this, this foreign bonds are bringing tuberculosis or they're getting reactivation tuberculosis, they are bringing drug resistant tuberculosis. In addition to that, we want to go to China and India and develop our industry. All these people going there are getting infected and bringing back tuberculosis. Believe it or not, almost two billion people in the world are infected with tuberculosis. So that's a slow time bomb. Every year, some of the new cases will be coming from this reservoir of two billion people who are asymptomatic but have positive PPD. I recently remember a case where one of my internal medicine residents who had negative PPD went to India and she converted her skin test. She doesn't know when, but when she was coming, one particular airline had a case of active tuberculosis. And the, and the, and the airline would not tell me the drug resistance profile. And I had to go through our state lawyer to have that particular airline, airline release the drug susceptibility profile because I was going to give isoniazid preventive therapy. But did you know that 15% of all tuberculosis in Bombay is INS resistant? In Mexico, there's a cough mixture that contain, contains isoniazid. You can buy without prescription. In many South American countries, you can buy robotracin with isoniazid without any prescription. No wonder they have 15 to 20% isoniazid drug resistance. 
Now, if I was going to give INS prevention for this recently converted resident, and if she was in contact in that aircraft that she traveled for 14 hours with the same 300 people, breathing same air, I would be treating wrong preventive therapy. Instead of INS, I should be using rifampin. And this information, when the actual information was released, became very clear to me that giving rifampin was the right choice for preventing therapy. Another epidemiological lesson comes from extra tuberculosis more common in HIV-infected patients. We all know that HIV-infected people tend to have higher incidence of extra tuberculosis. And I like to share some of my study to show that we had indication that the HIV impact is coming in Tennessee when we notice that the percentage of extra tuberculosis is increasing. The response to the therapy is same. And let me just show you. Now, this is just to wake you up. Believe it or not, back in old days, we used to inject the air in patients and give pneumothorax. Right now, if you give pneumothorax, you get sued for causing pneumothorax. But back in those days, before 1945, pneumothorax was the treatment of tuberculosis. The collapse therapy was the treatment. Do you know why, why collapse therapy was the treatment of tuberculosis? Mycobacteria are preferentially aerobes. They like oxygen. So if you collapse a lung and if they don't have oxygen, the doctors thought that the TB will die, TB bacteria will die. That really didn't work, but a lot of people got pneumothorax and collapsed lung. And this was medically insisting given. So doctors have done all kinds of uh, uh, go good or bad. This is my own paper, and I hate to talk about my own paper, but what we did was we looked at 109 patients of TB children in, in Tennessee between 1981 and 1988. And we noticed that 21% of these patients, 23 patients, would not have developed tuberculosis had the isoniazid preventive therapy started in time. During the same time, we also noticed that in Shelby County and Davidson County, the incidence of tuberculosis in children was going up. There was an indication, and I, I, I sent a copy of this paper to the director there in Nashville, to, to warn him that new cases of TB are occurring in your county, otherwise these children, and their incidence of TB will not be going up. And it did happen in the later years. This is to see if you know what this chest X-ray shows. Uh, the upper part shows a lot of fibrosis, but do you know what, what the second chest X-ray is? Some of the clinicians in the room might be able to know what this is. Actually, it is written on the title. This is called plumbage procedure. Multiple balls were injected or inserted in the lungs by the doctors to keep the lung collapse. Because when you give the air, uh, pneumothorax will go away, and a few years later, lungs will reopen. And doctors didn't like it. <laughs> What's wrong with lung, lung reopening? So they used to put small ping pong ball to keep the lung collapse. In the name of medicine, we have done tortures many a times, and we are still doing it. Uh, but, but if you want to know about the second part, you will have to call me again for lecture. <laughs> this is what happened in Denver. And, and people used to go for fresh air. And, and look what. Cold, fresh air was considered good for tuberculosis. The torture in the name of medicine. These young people with TB were asked to sleep in the outside veranda in Denver, Colorado winter, thinking that the cold air uh, will cure the tuberculosis. Many of them died of pneumonia. Nothing happened to tuberculosis. The good news is HIV TB comorbidity is slowly declining, and that I'm very pleased to note. Uh, I already mentioned slow time bomb. 13,000 new cases of TB in USA, uh, that is 10 to 15 million uh, have latent tuberculosis. 8 million new cases in the world, 60% of them in developing nations. More than 1 million deaths due to tuberculosis. 60% of all active cases are estimated to be reactivation. This means LTBI or latent infection could prevent 3 million new cases if we really put our mind to it. 10% of infected with normal immune system develop TB at some point in the lifetime. Now look, this is a tragedy of the most developed country on this planet. This is USA. 
we are the richest, most powerful country. American Indians or Alaskan natives, the case rate is 6 per 100,000. Asians, 25.6 per 100,000. Blacks, 8.8 .8 per 100,000. Native Hawaiians and other Pacific Islanders, 15.9 per 100,000. Hispanics, 8.1 per 100,000. Whites, 1.1 cases per 100,000. So you can see the racial difference in our, in our own country. And this is largely due to either poverty, lack of access, or lack of awareness among this group of people that they are at high risk of developing tuberculosis. From 1953 to 1984, reported cases decreased by an average of 5.6% per year. From 1985 to 1992, reported cases increased by 20%. Since 1993, reported TB cases have been declining again. 18,361 cases were reported in 1998. Now, this is an interesting study that will appear uh, in uh, AIDS Journal and Annals of Internal Medicine. Important thing to note is there were, there were 11,030 HIV positive patients in this study uh, without AIDS, followed by a median of 53 months. And you can see that the risk of tuberculosis increases if your T-cell count goes down. So as long as your T-cell count is around 400, you are not likely to develop tuberculosis. But tuberculosis is the first opportunistic infection that occurs in HIV infected. And that's why in all TB clinics throughout the country now, we get the HIV test when they develop tuberculosis. Because we have detected new HIV patients when they come to TB clinic. So that's the other way around finding new HIV cases. 944 HIV positive persons with uh, antiretroviral treatment in South Africa. Uh, TB is associated with only uh, with uh, current CD4 count, uh, not age, sex, prior TB, uh, WHO recommendation here. 25% decrease in TB risk per 100 cell increase uh, in this CD4 count. So if you improve the CD4 count in HIV patient, tuberculosis gets better a remarkable scientific information that can help tuberculosis. Now, we are doing this tuberculosis skin test. It's an it's a age-old test. We still keep on doing it. Uh, we know that half of the patients don't even come back. I mean, I mean, I'm sure Lisa knows. You do skin tests, and people don't show up to. Because once you do skin tests, you have to come back in 48 hours to be read. And a lot of people don't show up to be read. It also depends, on, depends upon how, how well you know how to do the test. Not every nurse knows how to do a good PPD skin test. And we are still following uh, this old-fashioned test uh, for littered infection. So new test is available now. It's called interferon gamma test. It's an M-tuberculosis-specific antigen, include early secreted antigen target 6, uh, asterisk 6 level, the culture filtered protein uh, 10. Uh, they are encoded by gene located within the region of, of the difference 1. And this particular test has now become very popular. It is sensitivity is high, uh, not useful in diagnosis of TB. I have seen many patients with active TB and have a negative gamma interferon test. Uh, high cost, yes. Tuberculin may, may boost IGRA, that is true. A few non tuberous mycobacteria, like Mycobacterium marinum, Mycobacterium sometimes Kansasia, can give you false positive uh, gamma interferon test. This comes from chest. And therefore, CDC recommends that the best place to use the gamma interferon test is for BCG vaccinated. If you have a positive skin test from BCG, your gamma interferon test will be negative. That's how you differentiate if positive PPD is from BCG vaccine. This is to keep you awake. This is uh, uh, Louis XIII, king of France. And, and even the kings get tuberculosis. So nobody's immune uh, from tuberculosis. Increased incidence of TB in children means there is an ongoing new infection. That is something I have learned from epidemiology of tuberculosis. So suddenly if one particular segment of your population has slight increase, that means new cases have come to your county. So you better find that person who is coughing on these children. Uh, pediatric TB tells us how effective is our preventive measures. One way to know the efficacy of Department of Public Health is to see how healthy your children are. This is a BCG vaccine. It is not as good as WHO claims to be. We are not using 
BCG vaccine in this country because the HIV, uh, if you have HIV infection, you get BCG, you get BCG genosis. The, the dormant mycobacteria can spread all over. But the second problem is BCG only reduces TB meningitis and maybe, maybe perhaps uh, CNS tuberculosis, but it does not prevent pulmonary tuberculosis. This is to uh, let you know that there are a lot of movies made and actors uh, who are acting as a TB patient. Uh, this particular actor developed TB himself while he was acting <laughs> as a TB patient. So it's an interesting story for the history of tuberculosis. But this is a paper I want to share with you. Uh, the tuberculosis site, if you look at between 2001 to 2006 in Tennessee, actually extra pulmonary tuberculosis was going up or has going up once the impact of HIV was felt in Tennessee. And what I like to show is the demographic changes in tuberculosis in Tennessee occurred five or 10 years after the demographic changes we are seeing in New York, California, or Florida. So if you monitor the demographic changes in, in California or Florida or New York, the program directors in Tennessee can say, well, this is what's gonna happen to us in five years. So you can prepare yourself at, at least five or 10 years ahead. And I'll show you the, another paper to, to, to prove my point. Between 1977 and 1981, in USA, there are 141,457 cases and 20,611 cases of extra pulmonary tuberculosis. That makes it 14.6%. In USA, from 1977 to 1981 group, in 1982 to 1986, the extra pulmonary percentage increased from 14 to 16 percent. And then in the 1987 to 1981, it went to 18 percent. This is the impact of HIV epidemic. The percentage of extra pulmonary went up. But look what happened in Tennessee. Between 1977 and 1991, there are 4,023 cases of tuberculosis in Tennessee. 455 were extra pulmonary tuberculosis. That makes 11.3 percent extra pulmonary tuberculosis. In 1982 to 86, it remained unchanged, 11.3%. That means the impact of HIV is still not perceived or is not impacted yet in Tennessee. But in 1987 to 1991, look what happened. Extra pulmonary tuberculosis started going up in the state of Tennessee, implying that maybe in Shelby County, maybe in Davidson County, maybe in some part of Johnson City, now, HIV patients with tuberculosis are changing the demographics or epidemiology of extra pulmonary tuberculosis. And this is the same paper just to show that between 1977 and 1981, the extra pulmonary percentage remained 11.3 percent, fairly constant. The point I'm trying to make is if you very closely monitor epidemiological changes, you can modify your program and you can prepare for what is coming. And throughout the world, this is not happening. People are reacting to what they find today instead of saying, let's prepare for what's going to happen tomorrow. And that's the biggest message I'd like to transfer today. The good news is uh, trends of HIV co-infection in tuberculosis patients uh, compared to the extra pulmonary tuberculosis in USA, uh, 1996 to uh, uh, 2005, extra pulmonary tuberculosis continues to remain high when the HIV TB co-infection is going down. What does that mean? And our CDC is still not responding to it. Why extra pulmonary tuberculosis that we thought is going up because of HIV has not coming down? And I'll show you another paper that I'm writing to, to point out to this, our national leader in Atlanta. There is something else going on that is causing extra pulmonary percentage to remain high. This is a plural lymphatic uh, and various sites of tuberculosis. We, we have limited time, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go over this. But look at this. 2% of all TB is bone in joint. 10 to 35% of all extra TB is skeletal TB. Spinal TB most often occurs, uh, affects lumbar and, and lower thoracic spine. TB abscess, I've seen at least seven or eight in the last few years. A complication of spinal TB, and it's usually, usually bilateral. I, I, a few years ago, I saw a, a young lady with uh, a, a MRI showing a, a nice lesion there, uh, and, and that turned out to be tuberculosis. Uh, this is a complicated uh, statement here, but 
But I like to point out that the, even when the HIV is going down, the percentage of extra pulmonary tuberculosis in USA is not going, going down, number one. And in later years, Tennessee started having higher percentage of extra pulmonary tuberculosis, which means the HIV impact is felt in Tennessee. And this is the recent paper where we are showing <clears throat> that percentage of extra pulmonary tuberculosis in Tennessee and in USA are going up in spite of the fact that the HIV is going down. And if you look at the logarithmic of annual incidence of TB per 100,000, and if you look at the uh, parallel lines, it should have gone straight like this, but you see this bump even after 1982, but then the bump continues even after HIV epidemic is gone. And we, 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 we did another, another logarithmic uh, analysis using Y and X value to show that the percentage of extra pulmonary tuberculosis going up is real and not just a statistical uh, abnormal finding. This is a case of miliary tuberculosis. You see multiple small uh, nodules there, and this is the uh, CAT scan showing miliary tuberculosis. And a very diff by the way, the typical presentation of tuberculosis is no more seen. I had a patient from nursing home who came with quote unquote depression, failure to thrive. And he was being treated by a psychiatrist. When I talked to him in detail, he had a little bit of cough, a little bit of evening fever, but he was not feeling well. He didn't have no appetite. A little bit of headache. Well, he had a little neck rigidity, went to spinal tap. It was CNS tuberculosis. So TB can mimic a lot of other diseases if you're not aware of it or not. Uh, this is a case of uh, lymphadenitis. Actually, this is very common in Mexico. Uh, and, and the CT scan uh, help us make the diagnosis. High percentage of extra pulmonary tuberculosis means TB HIV continues to be a public health issue. And this is what in our, our paper showed, uh, but let me show you something else. This high percentage of extra pulmonary TB that continued uh, also means the new immunocompromised conditions have contributed to the persistence of high percentage of extra pulmonary. We believe that something else is going on in our population where the immunocompromised patients continue to remain a significant part of our population outside just HIV infection. And we have identified mainly geriatric population, people with immunocompromised therapy, people who are taking Remicade or anti-rheumatoid arthritis medications. And there are studies after studies coming out that Increased use of immunosuppression will increase tuberculosis in your community. So now we are f dealing with a second threat of tuberculosis. And here is a paper that came out in New England Journal of Medicine, uh, treatment of uh, uh, Crohn's disease and rheumatoid arthritis. They were given uh, infliximab or Remicade, 120,000 patients, 70 of them developed tuberculosis. And second group were given uh, intercept, 95,000 patients, nine of them developed tuberculosis. But look what happened. 56% had extra pulmonary tuberculosis. So when there was a reactivation of tuberculosis, secondary to TNF drugs or immunosuppressive drugs, they not only had pulmonary tuberculosis, they also had extra pulmonary tuberculosis. So persistent high extra pulmonary tuberculosis as a demographic finding in USA could be due to increased use of radiation, chemotherapy, and new TNF drugs. And we need to be aware of this possibility. Uh, this is uh, one of my old papers to show that in Tennessee, actually 25% of TB is among high, high risk population. Patients with tuberculosis moved from, from ancient time caves to now under the railroad bridge. There are a lot of homeless people. Homeless people in Memphis have six to seven times higher incidence of tuberculosis than people who live there in their own homes. That is where our tuberculosis is. So we need to start looking at different places to find new cases of tuberculosis. I want to close with uh, another, another mycobacteria which is going up, mycobacterium marinum. I have a lot of patients who go for vacation uh, in, in uh, ocean front. 
uh, if, you, if you clean your fish tank, you can, you can get a little bruise, and that's the mycobacterium marinum, different mycobacteria. And this mycobacteria does not give you positive gamma interferon blood test. Uh, and it's a different disease. But now that you are dealing with fish and, and marine life, you might see uh, increased incidence of micro. As M tuberculosis goes down, I'm seeing higher number of cases of M avium and M marinum. So the, the epidemiology of the mycobacteria in the environment is also changing. There's some genetical changes in the my mycobacteria itself, perhaps. So what are the take home messages? How epidemiological changes impact TB programs and practice? HIV is declining, but other immunocompromising conditions persist. They are age population, uh, maybe we are doing too many CAT scans and causing radiation, use of immunosuppressive drugs, maybe gene therapy uh, is helping or hurting, drug addiction, alcohol, smoking, these are some of the risk factors. Organ transplant patients, number of organ transplant patients are going up, and they are also at the risk of tuberculosis. Epidemiological changes further, African American and other minorities have high incidence of TB, and that has remained unchanged in the last 50 years. So our healthcare system still has not been able to give a positive outcome to some of the African American population in this country. Foreign-born patients constitute 65% of total TB cases in the United States. Language and cultural barrier remains a big issue. Vitamin D level may be another risk factor for tuberculosis. Nursing homes and shelter homes, nursing home in East Tennessee has higher incidence of tuberculosis than general population. Atypical presentation has confused, confused our doctors because they are not used to seeing, I mean, God does not read textbook, by the way. You know, he just presents the TB as he likes to. I wish God would read, uh, read Harrison and send me a classical upper lobe infiltrate with uh, fever, chills, hemoptosis, and with the label, I am tuberculosis patient. That doesn't happen anymore. You got to put your thinking cap on. And, and the interesting issue is TB education in US medical schools. Total number of lectures that in any medical school that you will get is no more than one hour, including our James H. Curran College of Medicine. You barely get one lecture. You're allowed to give only one lecture on tuberculosis in the entire four years curriculum. So our new doctors do not know the vast history of this 5,000 year old disease that has killed millions and millions of people. And we have learned a lot by the research, by the people's efforts, and how we have tried to conquer this difficult disease. The good thing is we have DNA probe. Now you can make diagnosis in 48 hours, which we did not have before. Now we have DNA available that you can find drug resistance in less than five days. But we are not using that technology, at least in Tennessee. This is a sad story. If you have a completely drug-resistant tuberculosis, in, in Russian prison, 50% of all prisoners with tuberculosis have drug-resistant tuberculosis, minimum two drugs. And 15% had drug resistance totally. That means INH, rifampin, ethambutol, and PCA. Mortality of completely drug resistant tuberculosis is higher than leukemia, lymphoma, or some of the lung cancers. Not only that, when these people get out of the jail, God forbid one of us got the drug resistant TB, all you can do is resect that lung because no TB drug is going to work. So we need to be very careful about this. In summary, I would like to just uh, quickly say this. Social and environmental issues are very important. Single drug will soon cause bacterial resistance. Human beings do not like to swallow pills. So we use directly observed therapy, directly observed therapy. Do not reduce public health resources prematurely. What I have learned in my 40 years is, when you get too happy and, and, and celebrate your success and open the champagne bottle, be careful. Are you sure you are successful? In communicable diseases, unless you prevent the transmission of the infection, you cannot control the disease. Patient education is very important. Medical practice uh, goes through a witchcraft before it becomes a real science. Public health efforts is a teamwork, and money spent in prevention gives better yield than just the treatment of an active problem. I'm not going to read my poetry because time is less, uh, but in summary, all I want to say is this. When I was uh, four or five years old, I had smallpox. And thank God I survived. 
Was there any antibiotic for smallpox? No. Today, thanks to the smallpox vaccine, there is no case of smallpox uh, in the entire world for all practical purposes. Pneumonia is still here. We have more antibiotic than we ever had. But some of us uh, with gray hair might remember, all we had was sulfa and, and penicillin. Now we have cephalosporin and third generation, fourth generation, and we still have pneumonia as a leading cause of death. Treatment of the acute illness alone will not solve our problem of communicable diseases. <clears throat> unless we do something with the reservoir of infection, unless we prevent the transmission, unless we find an effective vaccine, we will not be able to eradicate tuberculosis from the richest country on this planet. Thank you.